And so I guess welcome everyone to this ninth in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme, Supporting Businesses in a Time of Crisis. I'm Will Pino, I'm the CEO of the Chamber. Today we are partnering with Campbell's to provide you with expert legal advice on the topic, managing landlord and tenant issues in a COVID-19 world. This session will explore relevant legal principles for commercial and residential tenancies, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We will offer important guidance for commercial and residential landlords and tenants on how to deal with scenarios ranging from non-payment of rent to negotiating and documenting variations to lease terms. To guide us through this topic today are three legal experts from Campbell's, Alistair Walters, James Dawson Smith, and Natasha Partos, whom I will now formally introduce. I'll introduce Alistair first. Alistair is a partner in the litigation insolvency and restructuring team at Campbell's. For over 25 years, Alistair has advised clients on complex financial services, business and insolvency related disputes, regulatory matters, and internal investigations. Alistair qualified as an English solicitor in 1990 and worked in the city of London until joining Campbell's in 1999. James Austin Smith is, James is a counsel in the litigation and dispute resolution department at Campbell's and has expertise in trial and advocacy and highly contentious matters. James joined Campbell's in 2011, having spent six years at another major law firm in Cayman. Prior to that, he practiced from, uh, from a leading set of chambers at the bar in London. He was the chair of the Cayman Islands Human Rights Commission established under the constitution from January 2015 to June 2019. And Natasha Partos, Natasha is an attorney in the litigation insolvency and structuring group at Campbell's where she specializes in commercial litigation, regulatory and employment law, as well as having experience in a wide variety of contractual disputes and tortuous claims. Natasha observed, obtained her bachelor's degree in history from Clare College, Cambridge in, in University in the UK. Thereafter, she completed her legal training in London and 2012 was called to the bar of England and Wales. So just before I turn it over to Alistair, I, um, I want to, to remind you that you can submit your questions during the presentation via the chat feature. We'll also be having our usual question and answer segment at the end of the uh, presentation. We'll be taking your questions during this segment. There's a raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen, which allows you to indicate if you wish to ask a question and at, at, and at which time we will bring you on the screen and unmute your microphone. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Alistair. I'm gonna share the screen so you'll see his presentation. Alistair? Yeah, thank you, Will, uh, and thanks to Will and Sharon in the Chamber for uh, organising this event, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, we're also very conscious uh, of the difficult times we're currently in and the pressures that it will be placing on uh, landlords, tenants, whether residential or commercial, uh, and we, we already have clients who are uh, seeing some of the effects of that. So we thought it would be a topical uh, subject to cover. Um, so Will, if you can just uh, advance the slides uh, so we've got the summary of the, the topics we'll be covering. Please. Okay. So if you all bear with us with the technology. And just one okay. more, please. One right. more. Okay. Thank you. So the overview is really as I've just, um, uh, if you can go back, Will. Um, Well, let's just start with this. And so the, we, we are going to cover residential and commercial tenancy uh, issues. And so if I can uh, ask uh, Natasha to, um, to start off, please, with the residential slide. So if you can go on forward, please. Will, if you can move one slide forward, please. Thank you. Okay, Natasha, thank you. 
implications on both landlords and tenants during tenancies and also particularly at the end of a tenancy whether that be because it's been terminated because it's a fixed term it's been surrendered or indeed it's been forfeited so on this first slide as you can see um, the giveaway is in the title the residential tenancies law 2009 governs the relationship between residential landlords and tenants now for the purpose of this law the law confirms that a landlord includes any agent of a landlord and indeed also includes anyone that the landlord has assigned the tenancy to so for example and we might see more of this at the moment if a property is sold when there are tenants in place the third party to whom the property uh, is sold to may also be considered the landlord under the terms of the law. Uh, part two of the law also confirms that it does not apply to circumstances where the properties are used for any commercial purposes. It doesn't apply where the premises are used as a hotel or motel. It doesn't apply if the property is used for in whole or in part uh, for agricultural, partial or horticultural commercial purposes. It doesn't apply to hospitals, homes or institution for the care uh, of the sick, the disabled or the aged. And finally, and this is important, it doesn't apply to situations where, for example, a landlord had a tenant in a room of the home, but they also live there too, because in those circumstances, the tenant doesn't have exclusive uh, rights over the property and therefore this law does not apply. Uh, you'll see the second bullet point on this slide uh, refers to the requirement for written agreements. Uh, this is something that we will return to during this session. Uh, it's not simply important just to, uh, as a matter of law to ensure that written agreements uh, are made at the outset, but as we'll go on to discuss, it's extremely important that anything that is agreed between a landlord uh, and tenant is noted down in writing because at the end of the day, if there is a problem, we're all going to look back on and rely on. Now, in terms of the residential and tenancy, residential tenancies law, section 15 is prescriptive about what a tenancy agreement must include. And the first thing is that it must include contact details for the tenant, including a service address. This may be particularly important if any of you at the moment are experiencing uh, tenants who in fact have left Ireland uh, and still owe you rent, they haven't paid any utility bills or they've left property. Uh, of course, you're going to want to be able to contact them uh, to either chase them for the unpaid rent or indeed know uh, what to do with their goods. The law also dictates that the date of the agreement must be recorded the amount of the security deposit that's being paid, the amount and frequency by which rent must be paid, the notice period required to vacate the property, that confirmation of which party is responsible for the payment of utilities and other outgoings, and also if the tenancy is for a fixed term, the date on which it will terminate. Uh, the landlord should also uh, prepare and provide to a tenant a copy of an inspection sheet setting out uh, what is in the property, so that's furniture and other goods, and also the state of repair. Now again, this may well be very important at the end of a tenancy if you've had a tenant who hasn't looked after the property well, has removed any items or indeed sold and replaced them, uh, and you're not very happy with their choice of sofas. If you have a tenant who's decided, in fact, they want to stay for longer than a fixed term, tenant, uh, their fixed term, then again, any variation must be recorded in writing. Uh, I'm gonna ask Will, if you could go back a slide for me, please. To slide five. Uh, I'm going to first look at what tenants' obligations are during the tenancy agreement, thank you. So first, and, and again, this reiterates a point uh, I've already made, if during the tenancy, uh, the occupant's name 
or contact details change, they are obliged to update and inform the landlord. Of course, you don't want a tenant who runs off Lee's Island and you can't contact them again. Uh, and happily, of course, in reality, it's quite hard as a landlord to enforce. Other tenant obligations are set out in section 36 of the law. They include naturally that a tenant must pay the rent and any other outgoings which are due and owing. They must ensure that the premises are occupied solely for residential purposes. They must ensure that the premises are kept clean and tidy. Importantly, they must inform a landlord if there are any problems uh, at the premises. Uh, and another issue that we might see more of, tenants are not permitted to allow beyond the maximum number of people to reside in the property. Therefore, if it states in the agreement that this is a two bed property, uh, tenants aren't allowed to allow their friends uh, to come and live with them, take up other living spaces. Uh, in addition, if the tenant has a pet and it's not mentioned in the tenancy agreement, they must seek approval uh, and consent from the landlord before having the pet at the, in their home. So what happens after a tenancy has expired or been terminated? Well, naturally, the tenant is obliged to leave the premises, as we'll come on to discuss Sometimes that's not as simple as you might imagine. They're required to remove all of their possessions, but to leave in place all of the landlord's property. They are obliged to ensure that the property is left clean and tidy, and they are to return their keys uh, to the landlord. Now, this is an interesting feature of the law. If you can show that damage has been done to the property, whilst uh, during the term of the tenancy agreement, the onus is on the tenant uh, to show that in fact, it was not due to any uh, misbehavior on their part. Now, this is an interesting feature because unlike other parts of the law, for example, in tort, uh, where if you are the wronged party, you have to prove that the damage was done. In this case, the onus is on the tenant to show it wasn't their fault. So there is some protection for landlords in that situation. Uh, of course, if a tenant has uh, intentionally uh, caused damage to a property, that could also be a criminal offence, uh, which would need uh, investigation. Now, if a tenancy has ended, uh, either because it's the end of a fixed term, uh, notice has been given, the tenancy has been surrendered, or indeed the tenancy has been forfeited, Tenants are still obliged to pay any rent which is due, which has been unpaid. Uh, they are obliged to pay uh, compensation if they don't leave the tenant, if they don't leave the property. Uh, and if they still refuse to leave, they are also obliged to pay an occupational rent, which would be equivalent to amount that was due under the tenancy agreement for the period at uh, which the landlord is not able to rent the property out to a third party. So again, there are some protections to landlords if a tenant refuses to leave. Now, just before we come on to landlords' obligations, I just touch on a feature of the law, which we may again see more of at the moment. And that is that tenants are permitted to sublet or assign their leases. So for example, if you're faced with a tenant who is no longer able to pay their rent, they decide to move out or move home, or indeed, uh, they've, for whatever reason, uh, lost their job, lost their work permit, and are required to leave the island. Uh, tenants are permitted, with the landlord's consent, to assign and sublease that lease. Landlords are not permitted to unreasonably withhold their consent. So firstly, as a landlord, you can't say, no, you've got to pay till the end of 2020, because that's what the lease says. But landlords also can't say, OK, yeah, you can let your friend Joe come and live in the property, but I want you to get a 20% higher increase in rent from them. Uh, that would be considered unreasonable. Uh, Will, thank you. Could we move on to slide six, please? So I'm going to look at now uh, landlord 
the landlord's obligations during tenancy. So I'm, I'm sure we'll get the slide in a second. So at the outset, as I've said, landlords have an obligation to ensure that the lease is in writing, that there's an inventory in writing, and they're also obliged to keep proper business records. So that is that a record system must be kept of when a tenant has in fact paid rent. A landlord is also obliged to keep a tenant's security deposit in an interest bearing class A account and must inform the tenant within 14 days of the manner in which their money is being held. A failure to do so uh, may mean that the landlord is, uh, well, it could be liable for a summary conviction of a, and a fine of up to $2,000. I'm sure that's all in hand uh, with everyone uh, online today. Naturally, the landlord must ensure that the property is in good repair uh, and suitable for uh, habitual occupation. And they must also keep up to date with any repairs that are required or, or compensate a tenant if indeed they have carried out repairs uh, on the landlord's behalf. Now, again, this is something that I'm sure we will return to during this session, but a key takeaway of this morning is that landlords are not permitted to re-enter the property that has been leased out, except for in specific and relatively narrow circumstances. They must ensure that the tenant is able to enjoy exclusive, private, uh, quiet enjoyment of the premises. The circumstances in which a landlord is permitted to re-enter a property uh, include with prior consent of the tenant, if there's an emergency, so you can, if there's a fire, um, water's leaking for example, uh, those sort of circumstances you may be able to re-enter. If a landlord gives the tenant sufficient notice then they may be permitted to re-enter. So that is not less than 48 hours notice and not more than 14 days in advance. If the landlord is there to carry out repairs or an agent is there to carry out repairs, they should be able to access the premises. Uh, and indeed, if there is an order of the court, they are permitted to re-enter. So this is really important. If you are experiencing difficulties with a tenant, there may be a, a natural tendency to think, well, I'll just go over. I know where the property is, I own it. I'll go over, knock on the door and see if we can just have a chat. Don't, because one, if you re-enter the property uh, without prior consent of the occupants, you may be in breach of this law. Uh, and indeed, uh, the tenant, if they're particularly difficult, may seek to bring criminal action against you. So those are landlords' obligations during the tenancy. Will, if I could ask you to turn to the next slide, that's slide seven, please. We'll look at landlords' uh, rights to possession and compensation. So ordinarily, if you have a fixed term tenancy, say for a year, at the end of that year, the tenancy will naturally come to an end and neither party is required to give uh, the other notice. Indeed, the parties can agree to surrender a lease by mutual consent in writing. Or indeed, a landlord is entitled to give notice uh, to a tenant to terminate the tenancy if they comply with specific uh, obligations under the law. And those obligations are as follows. A landlord can terminate an annual, so a year by year tenancy, by giving three months notice. And a landlord can give notice for any tenancy on a month by month basis, or indeed a week by week or a shorter period on one month's notice. So that's to say, if you want to terminate a tenancy agreement, if it's a year by year tenancy, you must give three months notice. Uh, and in practice for any other tenants, term of tenancy, it's a one month notice period. If you're faced with a difficult tenant, and indeed you don't want to, or you can't wait for three months, uh, a landlord also has the right to exercise his right to forfeiture. 
Now, the, this is where there's been a breach of a tenancy agreement and the landlord wants to re-enter the property or the premises. If there has been a failure by your tenant to pay rent, a landlord is permitted to give notice to the tenant and require that uh, the rental payment is made within 14 days. And if it's not, they will exercise their right of forfeiture. If there has been any other material breach of the tenancy agreement, the landlord must give notice to the tenant and a reasonable time to, if it's possible to rectify the breach, failing which they will exercise their right of forfeiture. If the uh, tenant no longer has a work permit or is adjudicated bankrupt, or if it's a company um, that, and they go into liquidation, they may also uh, forfeit the lease uh, and notice must be given. Now, this is an extremely powerful tool for landlords who want the right of re-entry, but sending notice of forfeiture does not in and of itself mean, right, now we can go round, evict the tenants uh, uh, and get rid of them and get some new people in. The right of forfeiture does not in and of itself, uh, we would uh, advise you, uh, give you permission to re-enter the property. Now, it may be right that if you are certain that the premises are uh, vac vacant, then you can re-enter. But in most cases, uh, it's almost impossible to be certain whether everybody has left or indeed anybody has left. And in those circumstances, you would go to the court and request that they make a possession order. Uh, generally, possession orders from the court will give a date by which tenants must be uh, out of the property, so vacated. And if they don't vacate the property, um, the, usually uh, the order will express, expressly say, uh, that bailiffs can be instructed to go in and evict uh, those tenants. So as you can see, uh, even with an order of the court, the power does not return to the landlord to evict the tenants themselves, but is put on to a professional third party. So again, if you've got an order for possession from the court, uh, the right thing to do is not go stick it on the door and say, you must leave, I'm coming in. Wait, allow the time to pass for them to vacate, and if they don't, uh, instruct, instruct professionals uh, to assist you with that process. Um, if you are certain that a tenant has left and they've not paid their rent, you can go to the court and the court can order that that tenant is liable to pay your rent up to the end of the fixed term of the tenancy agreement. So if you had an agreement that their tenancy would end in September, they've left without telling you you are entitled to get an order from the court that they are uh, they owe you all of the rent up until september alternatively if you're able to get new tenants in the court may order that you are entitled to recover the rent from your old tenants up until the date of the new tenancy agreement with the third parties or if it is a periodic tenancy the court can order that the tenant is obliged to pay you all of the rent up till 21 days after the landlord became aware that the tenant had vacated the property. So there is some protection if someone leaves you in the lurch. If the tenant leaves their possessions in the property, so you go in, it's a mess, there's personal items everywhere, um, you're not entitled to simply take them and throw them away immediately. You must wait two days before doing anything. If after two days they've not come back to collect their flip-flops and dive gear and the cost of storing their items is more than the value of the items themselves, then they can be thrown away. However, if the value of the items is not more than storing them, a landlord is obliged to store those items for 60 days and do nothing in that period and then thereafter is entitled to sell them at public auction. So if, uh, uh, we all hope this will happen to us, if you're left with an original Monet or Picasso, um, you're not entitled simply to keep it and think this is my lucky day. Uh, you must keep it safe for 60 days and then after the 60 days, you are permitted to sell it at public auction.
Now, if you sell it at public auction, unfortunately, you can't keep all of the proceeds. Uh, you are entitled to keep the reasonable costs of the sale, but then must return the balance uh, to the tenant. So the takeaway from this really is, if you've had a bad tenant, they haven't paid your rent, you still can't take their car that they've left on your drive, uh, sell it and keep that in lieu of the outstanding payments you're owed. Uh, you can't keep their telly. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you don't get to keep that Monet or Picasso uh, if it's left in your property. Uh, finally, on this section, um, regardless of how a tenant has left, if you have their deposit still, that must be returned to them within 14 days, unless they haven't paid their last month's rent, at which, time, at which point there is provision to allow a landlord to keep part of that security deposit to cover the last month's rent. So that's all I'm going to say on residential um, relationships. Well, if we could move on to slide eight, please. We're going to look now at the second uh, piece of legislation, which is of assistance to us. And that's the Registered Landlaw 2018 revision. And for our purposes, the relevant passage is Division 2. So this part of the law applies to commercial leases. And it states that any proprietor of land may lease it to another for an indefinite or definite period of time. The, right, uh, the agreement can be in writing and be for a fixed term, so a fixed term tenancy, or if it is not in writing or it is not for a fixed term, it will be considered a periodic tenancy. So interestingly, unlike in a residential situation, the resident, a registered landlord does not prescribe a list of things which must be uh, included in a written agreement. You can see the logic for that because in commercial settings, you, you usually have sophisticated parties who have commercial reasons for agreeing uh, their particular clauses. However, there are a number of things which the law prescribes will be inferred into any contract. Uh, these include that the tenant, the leasee, must pay rent and must comply with their agreements. Uh, and in exchange, the landlord will ensure that they can enjoy quiet and peaceful enjoyment of the premises. Uh, I'm just seeing that there is a little issue. I think some of you are struggling with the slides. Um, I think maybe the easiest thing is that we will try and circulate the slides afterwards for those of you um, who have had any difficulties. Um, but please be assured that I'm talking through uh, the content of the slides. So I hope you're not missing anything if you can't see the screen. Uh, to return to what will be implied in a commercial lease, uh, landlords are not permitted to use any adjoining land for purposes which would render uh, the lease unfit for purpose. So, for example, you could see a situation where um, a school has leased a land and then next door, the landlord decides to uh, start producing or manufacturing toxic goods. Uh, and in that situation, uh, it would render the schoolyard unfit for purpose. It's not permitted in the law. Uh, landlords must keep any common areas in good repair, including roofs, walls and drains. Uh, and this is something uh, that may come into play at the moment. Landlords must also ensure that if the property becomes unfit for purpose, and it's described in the situation as, civil, as a because of civil commotion or accident, not due to the negligence of the tenant, the leasee, they must make it fit for purpose. So the law doesn't prescribe a situation such as COVID-19 because of course it's unprecedented and we're all dealing with matters as they arise but you could see an argument running that landlords must ensure that communal areas are adequately cleaned, that any office space, uh, which is uh, corridors, for example, lifts, um, are ensured that they're fit for purpose and safe before any uh, residents or uh, tenants of those uh, offices return to work. 
So you could see an argument that there are uh, implied obligations on landlords at this stage to ensure that the properties are fit for purpose. Uh, of course, there are also going to be inferred provisions in any commercial lease uh, that taxes and rates are paid, uh, be it whether it's agreed that the landlord or the tenant are obliged to pay them, that fixtures and furnitures are kept in good repair, that workmen are permitted to go on site, and that um, the land will not be sublet uh, without prior consent of the landlord. Uh, Will, could we move on to slide nine, please? Thank you. So the situation with commercial tenancies is similar to residential. Uh, that is that if a tenant breaches any part of their tenancy agreement, goes bankrupt or goes into liquidation, then the lease may be forfeited. In that situation, the landlord must give the tenant notice that they are seeking to exercise their right of forfeiture. They must express the breach that's complained of. So if that's uh, non-payment of rent, uh, the period and amount due and owing should be specifically set out. If the breach is capable of rectification, then the time for compliance must be set. And if the breach is for any reason other than non-payment of rent, the landlord can also seek compensation um, from the tenant uh, and set the amount which is required in order for them uh, not to enforce their right of forfeiture. However, and again, uh, I hope it's being reinforced now, uh, this right does not permit a landlord to re-enter the premises. Um, the landlord still should go to the court and seek an order for possession. I should say there's a caveat to that, uh, and it's the same in the residential state setting. If you are sure that the tenant has vacated, then you are permitted to re-enter without a court order. But again, it suggests that that's risky. Uh, there could be complaint of uh, the landlord being in breach of an unlawful of their right to uh, lawful uh, privilege and enjoyment, and indeed criminal action could be taken. It's much safer to get an order from the court. Now the court has very wide powers uh, under the law of what it can order. In fact, it can order whatever it sees fit. And interestingly, in this commercial uh, setting, the court is expressly told that it must have regard to the proceedings and the conduct of the parties and the circumstances of the case. What can be inferred from this passage is the court will look at how reasonable both parties have been. The court will not uh, be impressed if landlords, uh, particularly during this period, have been unduly unreasonable. Equally, they will not be impressed if tenants are using COVID-19 as an excuse not to pay their rent. Uh, but they also will not be impressed if landlords uh, seek to try and re-enter the property uh, or in any way seek to intimidate the tenant in order to get them to vacate. So the message here is if you're going to exercise your right of forfeiture because you are having problems and a tenant is not paying their rent, um, act properly, uh, act in accordance with the law don't try and shortcut matters because ultimately when you go in front of a judge uh, they will be considering your conduct as much as the conduct of the tenant. Uh, finally, just um, as a matter of process, if a tenancy agreement uh, is surrendered by consent or indeed it has been forfeited or terminated uh, and prior to that it had been registered, uh, then you should inform the registrar so it can be removed. Now, I appreciate this is a lot of information. Um, we hope that not all of you are experiencing the difficulties um, that are covered by the law, um, but I'll pass over to James now to discuss some of the, the more practical tips uh, and implications uh, of the laws that I've been discussing. Um, thanks very much, Natasha. Good morning, everyone. Um, Will, can we move on one slide, if that's all right? Um, this was the... Uh, 
the break slide that our marketing department put in here. And I wasn't sure whether it was a, uh, a reflection on me personally or was intended to suggest I'm going to be talking about things that beyond the actual terms of the black letter law, beyond the statute law. Um, I, I'm hoping the latter, but we'll see. Um, I put up there some uh, what I called first steps. Um, they're in no particular order because obviously if they'd been in a particular order, the last one would have been first. Um, but it, it, effectively it could be described as um, check and talk. So firstly, what you need to do is find out where you are from your legal documents for your lease or your insurance or your mortgage, whatever that may be. And then engage with the other parties associated with it all in order to try and make the best of what is, you know, as we've been saying all along, a, a pretty much uh, unprecedented uh, situation. Um, can we move on to the next slide, Will? Um, so, dealing with the first of these sort of documents that most of you are going to want to put your hands on in a situation where it's getting um, challenging, the lease or the contract, um, as you'd expect, any lawyer is going to say it's going to need to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's difficult without seeing the contractual documents because there is such a wide variety of them out there. Um, it's also difficult in this situation because no one saw this coming, um, apart from Bill Gates and Barack Obama, but none of them were drafting these agreements. And so it's important to look at them, but it's unlikely to assist. Um, I put there uh, something in the second bullet point about frustration of a contract. Now, frustration of a contract is where it becomes impossible um, to perform the contract because the situation surrounding it has become so radically different from that which um, the parties contemplated that it simply can't go ahead. Um, no, no one's at fault. It's just the, the complete landscape has changed. Um, what happens is the contract is brought to an end, but it's very, very difficult um, to demonstrate that in the context of a commercial or residential lease, um, even in uh, circumstances like COVID-19. Um, you'd have to look at it carefully, but um, as far as I'm aware, and I'm prepared to be uh, corrected on this, um, I'm sure no one will hesitate, but there has never been a case in English or Cayman law where a commercial contract has been um, frustrated as a matter of law. Some of the courts have determined it's frustrated. Um, in English law, we've got um, various things that come close. Um, Second World War, First World War, uh, no frustration of commercial leases uh, in those. Um, Brexit, which is um, another British national disaster, um, obviously, um, the European Medicines Agency had a, a brand new shiny uh, office in Canary Wharf and wanted to get out of it because of frustration, court said no. Uh, possibly the closest we've got to this sort of situation is a Hong Kong case when, uh, when the SARS epidemic came out and the, the government kicked a tenant, uh, well, told a tenant he wasn't allowed in his apartment block. Uh, and he tried to run frustration and the courts there, which apply law very similar to Cayman law, said no, no chance. So uh, we think um, on balance, uh, it's not a uh, complete non-starter, but it's probably highly unlikely to be uh, a route to go down, even in these uh, quite unusual circumstances. Um, the final bullet point, I just put in something about ambiguity and contra preferentum um, because it's, you know, it wouldn't be the same without a lawyer mentioning some Latin. Um, the, uh, where a contract um, contains terms that aren't completely clear and could be read one way or another, those are likely to be read uh, or interpreted in the manner most favourable to the person who didn't draft it. In other words, if the landlord puts together a standard pro forma contract, says sign here, then all other things being equal, if it's ambiguous, the tenant may be able to take advantage of the, um, that ambiguity. Um, again, case by case basis. Um, Will, can you um, move us on to uh, slide number 13, please? Um, so obviously um, one of the first things you're gonna look at when you finish looking at your uh, contracts or lease agreements is um, 
is someone else gonna pay for this for me? Um, insurance, so no, back one please, Will, to um, insurance. Um, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, so insurance contracts, again, you know, it's all legal documents, it's gotta be analyzed on a case by case basis. A lot of them have got standard terms in, you guys, you know, you're, uh, you're all involved in business, and so you, um, you know, you know how these sort of things work. Um, the key sort of terms in this situation is going to be, uh, is there a business continuity cover provision? Um, possibly, but whether that is going to have pandemic, specific pandemic cover or cover for government action, both of which are the sort of you know, the key factors that are in play here, is, is highly unlikely. As again, as I was saying, people haven't just didn't contemplate a lot of this. If you've got it, great. Um, and if, uh, if you've got it and you have to claim, get on with it, do it fast, um, because there's also likely to be a clause that says you need to act promptly. So notify your insurer as soon as possible. Um, similarly, as a landlord, you're going to want to check uh, to see if there's any sort of clause in the contract where you have an obligation to your tenant to claim um, under the insurance. A lot of these contracts... Um, a lot of commercial contracts, landlords are required to take out insurance, tenants pay for it, then the landlord is required to claim on the tenant's behalf. So you need to you know, have a careful look at that sort of thing. Um, and then the final sort of aspect of it, what I put up there is mitigation of loss. Um, basically, that's, uh, again, many of you are going to be familiar with this, but you're not simply allowed to say, well, hey, well, that's great news. The insurance company's got that. I'll uh, put in my claim and I'm going to the pub. Well, not the pub, it's not going to be open, but you know, I'm going to uh, um, relax and let them worry about it. You've got a duty to try and, well, this, as I say, it says mitigate your loss, but you've got to try and make the best out of the situation you've been, you found yourself in so that um, your losses are no greater than they absolutely have to be. So if there's a possibility of subletting to an alternative tenant, or if there's a, a way in which you can um, limit your losses, however that may be, and you might need to think outside the box a little bit here, um, then you should think about that very carefully. Two good reasons for it. One, the insurance company won't pay if you didn't mitigate your loss. And two, if the insurance company decides to uh, uh, make it difficult for you anyway, you're still doing better because obviously you've um, managed to get some funds in uh, during that time. And I suppose of thinking about it as we go, um, it can take a while to get insurance payouts. Um, a lot of us found out after Hurricane Ivan. Um, and if you can keep cash flow coming in the meantime, so much to the good. Um, can we skip on one, Will, to the section on the bank? Um, I put that in there because obviously um, you know, they, this is gonna be a big issue for a lot of people. Um, Early engagement is vital. I mean, I, I can't overstate this strongly enough. Um, Natasha and I and Cam the Campbell's team do a, a lot of work with the banks. And I can tell you, uh, one of the things that is gonna annoy them more than anything else um, is being ignored or people simply not paying monthly payments due under mortgages or whatever they are and with no explanation. Uh, the, the converse of that is that uh, proactive engagement with a bank, particularly if you've got a good history with them, is the sort of thing they absolutely love. Um, they think that you're on top of it, that you're serious about it, you're um, keen to get the problem resolved, and they will want to work with you. It's a huge amount of political pressure on banks at the moment um, to uh, work with people in difficult financial situations. There's, there may well be legislation coming, although um, there's limit it's very hard to say at the moment, but th that may well be coming. Um, a lot of the banks have talked about mortgage holidays and giving people a break. In fact, I think pretty much all of them are. So um, check their website, check your um, contract or mortgage agreement or whatever, and, and, and engage with them. Um, I would deal with it how you wish. Um, if you're gonna do with it by phone, deal with it by phone, if you know someone there or you feel it's easier for you to express yourself on the telephone, go for it, that's fine. You can often get a much better result by actually chatting to someone. But if you do that for 
the, the, the best piece of advice I can give you is the moment you put the phone down, send an email saying to the person you just spoke and to whoever that may be, dear Alistair, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I confirm that we agreed this and that I would make this payment on the 22nd and that you were going to waive this and that we would speak again on the, on the 1st of June or whatever. Reflect it in writing. Um, any conversations or discussions, reflect it in writing so it's a paper trail. Um, and even more importantly, if you amend any contract, uh, absolutely do that in writing. Um, when people don't, um, that's great news for us because there's lots of litigation, we make lots of money out of it, but um, it really will save you a great deal of trouble if you uh, record these things in writing contemporaneously. Um, will, can we skip on to um, the next slide? Um, so again, this is um, common sense and I, I feel slightly loath to try and um, talk to um, people involved in business about common sense because you guys have got this sort of uh, got a good handle on this already. Um, the situation legally is it's highly unlikely you are going to be able to get out of this contract or this mortgage or this uh, rental uh, tenancy agreement um, simply as a result of the COVID-19 position. There may be other things that happen as a result, but just because of COVID-19, you're probably not going to be able to get out. Um, but everyone's in financial, uh, under financial pressure. And um, so trying to negotiate and talk to each other is going to be your, it should be your very firmly your first step. Um, and I've put there things which again are obvious. Reduced and delayed rent is better than no rent. Um, and I can tell you that reduced or delayed rent is cheaper than litigation. Um, so you do want to try and resolve these things um, amicably if you possibly can. And obviously there's reputational issues to consider there as well. Um, again, you're all business people, so um, you don't probably need any suggestions from me on how to think outside the box in terms of uh, a commercial situation. But, you know, can you renegotiate a, a payment in terms of timing? Can you move people from quarterly to monthly? Can you tie, if you've got a commercial tenant, their, um, their uh, rental payments to cash flow, for example, where you might lose out a bit in the short time, but you might gain significantly at the back end. So everyone um, tries to reach a solution that suits everyone. And this really is the sort of situation um, where you're, you know, you're limited only by um, uh, how creative you're prepared to be. But again, um, crucial piece of advice. Um, I think I've only used block capital twice in this. Uh, it, if you're going to amend it, do it in writing. Please, please, please. I mean, I mean, don't if you don't want to, because again, it's um, absolutely great for business for us. But um, if you want to avoid difficulties down the line, um, do it in writing. And if you're going to amend a formal contract, again, no one likes to pay for legal advice up front if you think it's all good and everyone's happy. But the number of cases we see in the litigation team where it's fallen apart because people thought they were agreeing something and they hadn't um, done it properly. And I can tell you it costs a lot more money to put it right after the fact than it does to sort it out in advance. Um, so uh, next slide, Will, please, um, which is, where are we? Uh, 16. We well, Tash touched on some of this, so I'm not going to go into it into too much detail. Um, I, I agree, obviously, with what she said. Um, these issues are unlikely to be affected, um, legally speaking, by COVID and the situation here, other than uh, how they are affected and your movement, ability to move and interact with people is, as is everyone in the public at large. So, for example, landlords' um, requirement to maintain the property, that will remain and you have a, a requirement to repair the property and that is still there. But um, if... Um, there is a hard curfew in place. You are not expected to breach the curfew in order to do that. It may be that um, if it's an emergency, um, you are entitled to, to, uh, to breach the, or to, and in fact, the regulations, the current lockdown regulations make specific provision for emergency. You're entitled to do things you wouldn't otherwise be prepared to do, but. I think the general rule should be that unless you already have an exemption, 
if you're thinking you need to go um, and do something that would otherwise be in breach of the COVID-19 um, public health regulations or the police hard curfew, you should get and you should write and obtain an exemption in advance. As much detail as possible, uh, and they're pretty good about responding uh, rather more quickly now. Um, deep cleaning, again, Tash touched on this. Um, it, this is, the contract will probably say who's responsible for that sort of thing. Um, whether it's the landlord and able to recover from the tenant or vice versa, or whether it's one party's um, responsibility in total. Um, look at it carefully. Um, if you're a landlord with multiple properties, you might um, want to consider the sort of reputational issues I've been talking about before, um, whether it's a good thing to do proactively to keep your tenants on site. It may be that there's a lot of um, property coming up for rent at the moment and uh, one way of keeping your tenant in place is by them thinking that you are the sort of person they would like as a landlord obviously. Um, again Tash uh, touched on access uh, not changed um, by the position that we find ourselves in now through Covid. Um, your, your obligations remain the same, uh, you can't simply go around because of the, uh, the situation we currently find ourselves in. Um, yeah, thanks, Will. Um, so litigation. Um, um, one of the things I often say to people is that litigation is a cudgel, not a scalpel. Um, it, is, it really should be um, your last resort. Um, it, if you can avoid it, you should. And particularly in the current uh, climate, it's not rapid. Um, courts are struggling the same way that the rest of us are to try and get matters heard um, and they are going to be when this starts to sort itself out and when courts start to hear cases they're going to be prioritizing what is um, emergency matters over contractual disputes um, I'm not saying contractual disputes can't be an emergency but um, there are going to be a lot of highly things and there's a, a formal uh, what they call practice direction from the court that has gone out and has told um, all of us lot that we should be agreeing adjournments and putting stuff off if at all possible. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you can avoid it, uh, you should. That having been said, one of the best ways to avoid it is to take legal advice early. Um, if you think that the thing is falling apart and it's going wrong, do speak to your lawyers. It may be that they can tell you, look, you've got a great case, to push on, or, well, actually, you might want to back off and try and um, negotiate your way out of this. You can probably save yourself a great deal of money if you talk to someone who knows what they're talking about early. Um, keep all the key documents, in, including emails. Um, these sort of contemporaneous records are absolute gold dust um, for us if something does actually go wrong. Uh, and the same thing, record all negotiations or variations in writing, as I think I've said about three times now already. Um, the, the flip side of that is if you put something in an email, do think carefully about it. Um, the, the, the way the lawyers will express it is don't put it in an email unless you want it read out in the Court of Appeal. Um, it, in times like this, when you might be frustrated or angry with people, particularly if you're sitting at home in your shorts and T-shirt, not in the office and the formality that's associated with all of that, it's very easy to fire off an email to someone that comes back in uh, back to uh, to bite you, and we all do it. <laughs> um, but uh, I would consider what you're going to say, write it, go to bed, wake up the following day, and then send the one you can send, um, and think how it would look when a judge reads it out in due course. Um, and then finally, on on the question of litigation, if you do instruct counsel, please go through us. Um, <laughs> If you've taken the time and the expense of speaking to a lawyer, um, you'd be surprised the number of people who um, do all of that, instruct the lawyer, get the legal advice, um, and then uh, decide to speak to the other side or the other side's lawyers without involving their own lawyer. Um, it makes, makes our life very difficult and puts you guys in a very, very difficult position. Um, I'm not saying you have to take everything your lawyer te tells you as gospel. Um, you know, we give you the advice, you take it or leave it. But, but, but it does make our lives very, very difficult if you instruct us to do something and then go and do something separately yourself. Um, so, final slide. Um, well, uh, interesting. Uh, I suspect that everyone's got an opinion on this and um, none of us know uh, quite where it's going to go. Um, 
government has said it's following a New Zealand model, uh, which is, and I'm sure everyone knows this now because we've all become experts on COVID-19 and uh, virology over the last few months, but uh, that is effectively a lockdown and um, an eradicate um, policy. In other words, they are going to try and get to a situation where um, the, the virus is not widely spread within the community and that we can be able to move freely about the community subject to certain restrictions. The difficulty with it is that that um, approach can only end, and we haven't had anything formal from government on this, but as a matter of logic, it, it seems that that approach can only end when there is a vaccine in place or um, by allowing people to quarantine as they currently require to do when they're, when they're uh, arriving back in the islands. Now, vaccine best guesses are 12 to 18 months. So you're in this for the long term. Um, if you're a, uh, in, the, in the business which is relying on tourism, um, then you're going to need to think very carefully about uh, how you mitigate your losses with respect to that, whether you uh, repurpose the, um, the properties that we're talking about or um, the business that you're involved in, how you try and think outside that box. And again, you're all commercial people, you're better at doing that than I am. Um, but uh, if the government sticks on its current path, um, we, we are looking like a significant period of lockdown. Um, legislation, um, certain countries um, have brought in legislation to help out landlords or tenants or other people struggling with the, uh, the financial impacts of all of this. Um, it's, not, it's not a classic came in government response. Um, they, they, they are relatively slow to reach for their checkbook. Um, and that is not something you see very frequently. But then this is not a, a situation that comes up very frequently. Um, so I think probably the key thing here, um, apart from my fortune telling attempts, is to monitor. Monitor very carefully what's being said by government, what's being said by your uh, industry bodies, um, and again, what's going on globally to see where we might try and uh, find ourselves and to try and prepare best in that situation. And then obviously the final thing I've said as part of that is to maintain engagement. Maintain engagement with your landlord or with your tenant. Keep talking, um, make sure you know where they're going, what they're thinking, so that you can try and best place yourself to, to deal with what is literally an unprecedented situation. Um, thanks, James. James, a question came through um, during my part, which I didn't answer. So if I just come back to that before we go to more general questions. Um, it was asked, um, let me get it up. Um, if you're informed of a problem, but they didn't fix it, who is, who is liable for it then? So I take this to really go back to what the point James made that landlords have a general gold standard standard obligation to rectify or remedy any defects uh, which render a property unfit for purpose. So be that in a commercial or a residential setting. So the golden standard in a normal situation would be landlord's duty to fix. Of course, we're not in a normal situation. So if you're not able to get an exemption because it's not an emergency, um, or it's not something where the service provider is actually able to go in and fix. For example, I know people have had um, issues with ele electrical compliances and things like that. Um, again, uh, the obligation on the landlord may be temporarily uh, restrained. If it's something that the tenant has told you that they are going to fix and they fail to do so, that's a different situation because the tenant also has an obligation to keep things in good repair. And if in good faith the landlord has uh, relied on their assertion that they will fix something and they fail to do so and it causes damage to the property, uh, then there may be a shift in liability towards the tenant. So at the moment, it, it's a slightly moving feat. If it's an emergency, as James said, there are exemptions that you can obtain. Um, in general, the obligation stays with the landlord.
Um, I can see we've got a residential lease question come through, but it, it's not come through in full on my screen. I'm happy to come back to that one. Are there any other questions coming through? I don't see any right now, but maybe no, there's one here. So how do you recover unpaid rents once the economy has opened? So the, the situation with recovering rents in a legal sense hasn't changed uh, before COVID started. Now, COVID, now we're in the middle of COVID or when COVID um, hopefully uh, leaves us on our beautiful island. Um, the situation remains that if a tenant has failed to pay rent um, or any rates and you are owed money, um, you are entitled to recover them through the court. However, as James indicated, um, courts at the moment are not operating at full capacity and therefore it's likely that we'll see a backlog of those types of issues in the courts when they do open in full. But the right to recover unpaid rent hasn't changed. So yeah, and, um, yeah, and um, we, we typically do this. We do a lot of these sort of things. So as a quick plug for Campbell's, we have a fixed fee um, system set up to do these small claims for people to try and keep as economic as possible, um, dealing with letter before action right the way through to, to the enforcement stage. So uh, <laughs> that's our little plug there. So the next question is basically about people who are waiting for their pension payments and you know what's your recommendation on that one? Would a landlord enforce interest on the late monthly rent payments or would that be seen as not fair? If you, if you don't have a specific clause um, to permit you to claim interest on rent then it is likely that that wouldn't be enforceable. Um, your recourse then again would be to make a claim for unpaid rent. Now, that's a very legalistic approach to this. The reality of the situation, as we've seen, is that many people have had to leave the island. If you have a tenant in place, as a landlord, uh, your strongest position at the moment is presumably to keep that tenant. If there's a slight delay in receiving rent, you might take a commercial approach to this and think it's better to have rent, albeit a few weeks late, than A, and I don't want to do us out of business, but pay lawyers to start enforcing things, or B, potentially lose that tenant completely and not have any rent at all. Um, so that's, that's more of a, perhaps a, pr a practical slant on an approach. I, I completely agree, and I mean, the. Um, amount of t delay before getting a pension payout if they've um, made an application is going to be 45 60 days so could call it two months um, at the outside the um, the interest on that is going to be relatively insignificant and certainly by comparison to the the various legal fees not even the lawyers fees but the the court filing fees and everything associated with it. The time and hassle and ill will generated, I absolutely agree with Tash. I'd probably let it slide if I possibly could. So another question, is there a way that you can negotiate a lower rent with your landlord who doesn't want to budge on a commercial rental? So you can always negotiate. Um, you might find actually as a tenant at the moment, you're in a slightly stronger position than you were eight weeks ago um, because as, as we've indicated, landlords are likely to want to keep good tenants in place. Having said that, uh, the answer really is in the question that it's a negotiation process. So if you have a fixed term tenancy with a fixed term uh, rental agreement in place, it's the only way to get out of that is by negotiation. Um, if this is a new tenancy or you're negotiating for the next fixed term, um, you may be in a stronger position uh, by saying, well, we're not going to have the same commerce and the uh, and new influx of residents in the island in the next 12 months. Let's come to an agreement. Oh, well, lots of questions now. I think people have woken up. <laughs> it's very good. So this is an interesting one because it's a situation that's probably going to happen for some people on the island, unfortunately. It says, if I'm required by my work 
to leave Ireland on leave of absence, does that still allow me to terminate my lease? So as, as I am not losing my job, but I am signing a document to say I will leave. So if, if um, a tenant if doesn't have a work permit, then that is a right of a landlord to terminate their lease. Um, the law doesn't prescribe that it's um, the other way around. So the obligation, the, the, the lease can be forfeited in that situation. Um, I think practically um, this depends very much on fact specific, whether you're also suggesting that you want to return to the property afterwards, um, whether you want to consider subletting the lease. Um, in fact, if you're returning, um, what happens with your work permit? Um, you may not have a ground to specifically terminate the lease. It may be more, can I sublet it for the period that I'm not permitted, to, I'm not going to be on island. Um, but I think this is, this is quite a complicated question that's probably fact specific. I don't know, James, if you've got anything. No, I, I entirely agree. It is going to turn on the facts. Um, but if, you're, if your uh, employer is requiring you as part of your employment to leave the island, um, then you may well be wanting to say to them, well, hang on, who's going to pay for my rent um, in this situation? Why should I pay rent in whatever country you're referring me to, uh, sending me to work in and also in the place where I, where I live? Um, and there may be some scope for that, but I agree, subletting is the way to go, probably, if you can possibly achieve it, depending on what you're trying to do with your personal property, when you're going to be back, all the other things Tash said. Um, so many of these are fact specific and, that, and also so many of these are personality specific. Um, the individual you're in, is, again, everyone knows, there are some people you can do business with who are sensible um, and you think, well, I, I might be prepared to give them a break. Um, there are other people who take an overly um, letter of the law approach to things and it makes it very difficult. So the next one is, if a lease states a maximum number of occupants, does that trump the section of the tenant law maximum permitted? So if I understand this question correctly, um, you've agreed as maximum amount of people who can be in the property um, and your contractual arrangement um, you're concerned whether when I've said that you can't go over and above the maximum prescribed in the law that there isn't a maximum occupant that's set out in the law so it is a contractual arrangement what you can't do is say we've taken out a tenancy either two couples one couple family of four whatever it is and then because of the situation we're in move in another family or another eight people to try and sh share the costs, you would have to get written consent from the landlord for the extension uh, in that situation. Does it, just, just as a follow-up to that is, does the planning law or is there public health law that stipulates the maximum number of occupants in any rental property? Um, well, it's a good question, and it's one that I'd have to go um, and look. I wouldn't want to give an answer that wasn't accurate, particularly if people are actually experiencing this at the moment. Yeah, because if you had a 2,000 square foot house and you're saying you're going to put eight people in it, I would have thought that that's unreasonable to public health. But the next one is, if, if my tenant is unable to pay their rent due to their employment being terminated, what are my options as a landlord? Can I give them notice and end the lease? I think you may have answered that, but maybe the person was joining a little late. Um, yeah, you, in short, you, you, as a landlord, you have the right to exercise your right of forfeiture. And one of the grounds that you can uh, exercise that right is non-payment of rent. Uh, what I should say is that you, um, you have to wait until they've actually not paid their rent. You can't take action because they're simply telling you in three months time they might have a problem. So can you keep, the other one is, can you keep the security deposit if a lease is broken? The employer is flying the employee off file and due to the COVID-19 and not renewing their work permit. So the, um, the fact of flying them off, the fact of COVID-19, um, the fact of not renewing the work permit doesn't impact on your right to maintain the security deposit. Um, as a landlord, you are only holding the security deposit on behalf of the tenant. It's not your property. Uh, the proprietary rights stay with the tenant. If, however, when the tenant leaves, 
um, they owe you rent, then you may be permitted to keep this, this security deposit um, to pay that last month's rent. Uh, you can't keep it for some sort of compensation because the lease has been uh, broken. Uh, in that situation, um, I, I hope you'll recall, I talked about the situations a court might order that a tenant uh, must pay rent either up to the end of a fixed term tenancy or until a third party enters into a new tenancy agreement uh, to enter those premises. But you can't simply just keep the security deposit in those situations. It's a question about uh, for deposits that must be held in interest bearing accounts. Does this mean that each individual tenant's deposit must be held separately in their own accounts or can multiple accounts be held in a combined account? Um, the honest answer is that I would have to go away and look at this because this is more of a banking question. The law, it's the legal, uh, the law doesn't state the provision. What must be clear, uh, and I, I infer from it, is that it must be in an account. And I would suggest that that means that it ought to be in its own account so that the, uh, the sum is identified. Um, but I wouldn't want to give anyone the wrong information. Right. Yeah, and um, Tash is right. This one gets very tricky very rapidly indeed. Um, and uh, the, key, the key point is keep it in a separate account and don't be using it for any other purposes at all. Right. Now, the next one's interesting because obviously we're all in self-isolation and a lot of tenants probably have higher electricity and water bills than they're probably used to. Uh, so, um, you know, if your tenant have run up CUC and water bills up to disconnection, do you have ground to re-enter the property before it goes into a total disaster? I think both CUC and the Water Authority have given people three months and said no disconnection. Um, so that one shouldn't come up for a little while, which would give me a tash enough time to research the position. But, but um, the... <laughs> I think the position is if your property is going to be damaged um, as a result of action by a tenant, um, then you would be entitled to take certain measures, various measures, in order to stop that happening. Um, uh, one of which, I mean, obviously the most simple one is to pay them, your, pay the rent yourself, and take the money out of um, the water or the CUC bill yourself, and take it out of the uh, um, security deposit if you can do that. Um, and if it becomes apparent that the person is continuing breaching the term of their lease, which requires them to pay for the electricity and the water, then you probably have grounds to terminate the lease. There's a very lengthy question here. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I read the whole thing, but there, according to this issue, there's I've come across situations where there are two tenants on an agreement. There is an option to break the lease with 30 days' notice should their work permit not be renewed. One tenant has served notice, the property management company is now telling the other tenant that they must take the whole lease on after initially informing them that they would re release both upon notice from the lease. This is a legal question. <laughs> uh, they have gone back on this and advised that they take the lease uh, in their name for 75% of the rent. Wow. Um, I'll let this you read the rest, but that seems confusing. This is good. It's like an exam question, um, applying the facts to the law. Um, and this, this really does require looking at the lease. This, um, if there is a joint and severability clause, um, that is the key to this answer. Whether if um, one tenant decides to leave, whether the other becomes liable for the whole lease, um, or what their obligations are, but I, I, that's the start and the end, uh, and probably the end point of this. So um, I'm not shying away from an answer, but really you need to look at the contract to see what it says. Yeah, absolutely right. And the contract should say very clearly what the responsibility is. And it may be that um, uh, the landlord would, if he thinks uh, or she thinks they're going to lose both tenants, would want to consider um, varying it to do some sort of 75% reduction. That might be exactly the sort of sensible negotiation we've been trying to suggest throughout. But, but the, the legal position will be absolutely clear on the face of the contract. Just to add into that, um, if, there is a, if there are disputes of these nature that many of you are experiencing, um, mediation may be 
a more productive and better use of resources than simply instructing lawyers and it become adversarial immediately. Um, and mediation in this context would be a roundtable discussion with or without lawyers in a more neutral uh, and less aggressive form than simply uh, filing a, a notice of uh, forfeiture, for example, um, or losing both tenants in the example we've just seen. Uh, this, is, this is unprecedented, and I know we're all a bit bored of, of that phrase, but we've got to look at the commercial reality of trying to maintain relationships where possible, uh, and mediation is a very good way of achieving that. I'm not sure, Alistair, if you wanted to chime in about the mediation side. Um, yeah, I, I, I certainly can. Um, there is a, a mediation association on Ireland. Uh, I'm, I'm the chairman of that. And if people do need help with, um, you know, the, the mediation process in terms of how it works uh, or suggestions for mediators, uh, then they can contact me um, either direct or through the association. I mean, it's definitely a very useful tool. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, it's private. Uh, and as uh, James and Natasha said, you know, a lot of this is about coming up with creative solutions, uh, which you likely wouldn't get from a judge. It's also quick um, and, and should result in a written, written uh, agreement if one could be reached. So I would definitely encourage it. Excellent. There are a lot of questions, so thank you. Um, I guess we have another a few minutes if you guys want to stay on the line, if that's all right. You good? You good for time? Of course. Yep. Okay. I don't know and if we have the, to do, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> one comment uh, will I make about the, the question of how deposits are held. I'm, I'm just seeing a comment from uh, Michael. Uh, and I think as long as a landlord is hold, holding tenants' deposits in a segregated account, so separate from their own money, separate from their own... Uh, business interests um, and it's they're in an account that's identifiable then I think the the fact that deposits are, are from different tenants are co-mingled is not such a problem it's more making sure that collectively they are kept segregated from the landlord's own money yeah and that must be right Alistair because otherwise it'd be, you'd have to open a separate bank account for every single right. tenant you had which would be a, a nightmare practice. which is not, not practical yeah yeah I agree there's a there's a question from Juliet. If you have a commercial lease in place until 2021 and your landlord calls us to say they now want to redevelop the premise, do you have the right to kick, they have the right to kick me out of the leased property? And what are my rights with a lease in place to September 2021? Oh, I, I'm going to say it before Tash says it. I hope we're going to say the same thing, which is it's going to depend on what the lease says. Um, and also the, the basis upon which they want to require you to leave. Um, if the lease says the landlord may give notice to read, uh, of 60 days to redevelop um, and kick you out, then tough, I'm afraid that, that, that will apply. If the lease, uh, if the landlord says, I need to get in to redevelop this property because it is actually actively dangerous now, that might give them authority to do it. But if the position is simply, you're quite happy there, the property is fine, your business is fine, you're paying your rent as you're required to under the law, um, then they cannot kick you out without breaching the, uh, the contract and they would need to, um, they'd need to try and re renegotiate it with you to do it. Um, to get you out physically, they'd have to go to court and there wouldn't be a judge that would give them um, that, uh, that sanction. Yeah, I agree. So the if, the, if there is a notice provision that gives you six months or three months notice and they're complying with that, then you may be in difficulty. Um, but again, it really does depend on the contractual position. I agree with James. Uh, another question is, um, it's a, probably a question that's going to affect a lot of people in the island. Obviously, the tourism sector is not going to come up for a while. There are Caymanians and, and uh, guest workers who we hear that have lost their jobs but they're gonna stay for a while. Uh, maybe some of them are waiting for their pension payments in order to leave the island. So basically it puts a landlord in a, probably a pickle a bit. Um, they probably don't have much money. So what really, what can a landlord do for those situations where the person really does not have any money in the short term because of what has happened with the economy? I think we touched on this um, with one of the questions earlier that 
there is an aggressive approach which is very legalistic that is if someone doesn't pay their rent on time or otherwise breaches a lease agreement uh, landlords have right to forfeit that lease terminate it um, and seek action in the courts to recover unpaid rent in reality um, as you say many people are going to be experiencing these difficulties particularly in the tourism um, sector and, and really it's that goes back to Alistair's recommendation of mediation um, whether in a formal sense with a mediator or just between the landlord and tenant if you think you have a tenant who in two months time is going to be able to repay the arrears and also keep up to date with their rent uh, you may well think that that is a much stronger position to be in than to have an empty property where you're paying the strata fees and insurance. Um, it may also be that you think, well, this is a tenant who's otherwise been good by Christmas. Hopefully we'll get some tourism back. Um, so we're going to give them a six month reduction in uh, rent. We know the market is changing. We can see the rental market. It, it's like having a slight reduction anyway. Um, and you might take a commercial view that it's better to have someone in than be in that pool um, of reduced rates that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the other potential option is depending on how difficult the times the individual, your tenants find themselves in. If it's a, a residential um, property, you might want to suggest they speak to the needs assessment unit of the, uh, the government because there can be provision made to pay rent. And again, um, and government's been very good on this actually. Um, talking about normally the, the NAU will only cover you if you are uh, a companion, but um, in these circumstances of COVID-19, what they have said is that they will make provisions so that nobody is left in a position where they don't have a roof over their head or can't feed themselves. And that would include um, potentially making payments for rent in certain circumstances. Um, as, a, as ever, it's not easy to get the government to, to whip out their checkbook, but for this situation, they are showing a good deal more flexibility than usual. And then I think maybe the last question we have here is uh, if, a commercial, if a commercial tenant, sorry, not sure that's me, if a commercial tenant has negotiated a reduction in rent and also sublet of their premises, should they automatically pass the reduced rent to their subtenant or is that a separate matter? A uh, separate matter. Yeah. Already, yep. well, legally, uh, anyway. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we've kind of come up in an hour and a half of this this webinar. I'd just like to thank thank all of you guys at uh, Campbell's. Uh, again, if your if your tenant landlord matter is a bit complex, it's important to get legal advice. Don't think you can take it on your own. It can become very difficult. And again, if you're in a situation where maybe you can't afford legal advice. Alistair there chairs the mediation body that maybe can assist as well. And also those companies that uh, are bit people that are struggling in terms of, of the economy and not losing their jobs, remember that there are uh, ability, particularly for Caymanians, to get us, um, some assistance uh, in various ways through the needs assessment unit. And also for those businesses, government has put in place a small business uh, loan program or a grant program as well that you could check to see if you qualify. So I'd like to thank everybody again for tuning in. Our next webinar is planned for Friday. We'll be dealing with IT matters and uh, we'll be sending invites out because obviously it's a new normal. The webinars have become very popular, but there are a whole bunch of issues related to IT and security and privacy. So we want to talk a little bit about that on Friday. So thank you all for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the in the chamber for setting up. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Stay safe, everyone.